welcome to uh, today's session. As we discussed in the last uh, module, we are going to look into uh, transistor level design and sizing of transistor for a two stage uh, OPAM that we have been uh, working on. And uh, in the very beginning of the uh, sessions, we looked at the high level specifications of the system, which is uh, biomedical front end acquiring a neural potential data. And we derive certain specifications for the front end amplifier, for example, in terms of bandwidth gain, uh, the precision required, accuracy required, and uh, so on. So, we will revert back to that discussion, and from there, we will try to link the transistor level parameters, the transistor dimensions. Now, we have all the other information, all the other recipe required to do the sizing. We have the noise analysis, we have the you know, frequency response, we have the uh, uh, compensation, stability, all that coming into picture. Uh, also, other considerations related to signal swing, etcetera, that we are also aware of. So, we have all this recipe based on that, we can uh, look at the transistor sizing required to meet the high level specification of the amplifier. So, let us get started. So, let us uh, recap very quickly the signal characteristic that we were looking at. So, uh, we are looking at the neuro potential signal which is having signal content say from 0.5 hertz all the way to uh, say one few hundreds of hertz basically 100 hertz. And uh, in order to save this signal uh, which is having a very uh, small magnitude 10 micro volt to say 100 micro volt. In order to save the corruption of this signal from noise, we uh, discussed the concept of chopping and uh, we considered shifting this signal to a high frequency with the help of a chopper. Uh, and we discussed the concept of 1 upon f noise and how chopping can help us in mitigating the 1 upon f noise effect. So, uh, through design uh, and analysis, we can of course, try to push this 1 upon f corner frequency towards lower side and we have seen that uh, in the different amplifier topologies that we have discussed uh, how the 1 upon f noise depends upon the transistor sizing so, and of course, the bias current. So, uh, one target can be that for a given bias current limit that you have for a given current budget that you have in the circuit, you can try to push this 1 upon f noise corner towards as low frequency as possible and likewise, another target happens to be to minimize this white noise level for the noise spectrum. And once we have done that, then we decide the chopper frequency f c with which we are going to multiply the signal and uh, we assume that f c is sufficiently higher than this 1 upon f corner frequency, maybe at least 4 or 5 times higher than the 1 upon f corner frequency. So, that the uh, input signal is sufficiently isolated from this uh, 1 upon f noise spectrum. And uh, in our case, if we are say able to push down the 1 upon f corner frequency to say 100 hertz and then assume that the f c should be at least 5 times or say to be more conservative 10 times higher than that, then you have a chopping frequency of 1 kilohertz available. So, suppose 1 upon f corner frequency is 100 hertz and the chopping frequency is uh, accordingly 1 kilohertz and an order of magnitude higher. This is a little bit more conservative, I can go for slightly lower also, but let us uh, target little bit com uh, conservative values. So, let us keep the chopping frequency to be 1 kilohertz. So, now this is the chopping frequency for the amplifier. From there, we need to look at the amplifier bandwidth required to support this chopping frequency. So, once again, if I look at the uh, chopping behavior, ideally, if I do mathematical modeling, the chopping would imply multiplying of an input signal with plus minus 1. So, this is plus and this is minus 1, and you have the uh, input signal varying, and uh, mathematically, I can just multiply these two and get my output signal, desired output signal. But when we are trying to implement this in the circuit, ultimately we have the amplifier input. Suppose this is your feedback amplifier with the feedback component included within this triangle. So, we are trying to uh, have this implementation using cross couple switches and we have seen that during the first phase phi 1, the input gets connected to the first you know polarity plus minus and in the alternate phase phi 2, the signal polarity gets reversed and the signal will be getting connected to the minus plus terminals. And this effectively means that in the phi 1 cycle, the signal over here uh, is getting multiplied by the gain a f 
if the closed loop gain is a f thus in the phi 1 cycle it is getting multiplied by a f in the second cycle phi 2 the signal is getting multiplied by minus a f and hence we have a plus minus a f multiplication uh, happening on the input signal. And uh, ideally of course, that would mean that the output signal if I look at the fully differential output v out plus minus v out minus that will be just getting chopped accordingly. So, you will have the overall amplifier signal getting chopped. So, this is what we expect. So, if I look at uh, v out plus this is your v out plus minus v out minus we expect the input signal I am assuming this is your v in plus minus v in minus input signal getting multiplied by this plus minus 1 as a result every cycle you are getting the output signal uh, changing the polarity in a uh, step wise fashion. Now, this is a mathematical picture, but if you look at the circuit of course, circuit cannot have a ideal step like rise and fall time it will take some finite time to settle to a certain value. So, for example, if I consider one particular time instance where the phase is changing from phi 1 to phi 2 there of course, the uh, the signal the input signal is uh, sh shifting the or reversing the polarity and within this uh, rise time or within this duration the output signal should finally, settle to a times v in plus minus v in minus. So, if I assume that this is going to act like a step function. So, the clock function assume that clock is the clock which is the phi 1 it is acting like a step function and it is getting switched at a certain frequency given by f c 1 kilohertz. So, within the uh, half time period of f c assuming 50 percent duty cycle within this half time period of f c the signal which is coming at the output should be able to settle. So, the output signal finally, should be able to settle. If I assume say uh, that the amplifier is a single pole system assume that there is one dominant pole. So, I can re represent the amplifier transfer function as 1 upon 1 plus s upon p where p is the dominant pole and uh, this is basically representing a single pole R c system. So, I can uh, represent this as an ideal amplifier followed by an R c uh, low pass RC filter. So, I can represent this as a ideal amplifier with gain A and an RC filter where 1 upon RC equal to P. And uh, if I represent the time constant T as say 1 upon P or 1 upon uh, sorry uh, time constant as 1 upon P or RC, we know that this kind of system is going to have uh, overall uh, time domain response given by V naught. 1 minus e to the power of minus t upon r c. So, if v naught is the step that is the output is supposed to take suppose v o is the step that is the output is supposed to take means it is going to uh, change from v to v plus v naught. So, this is the overall step that is expected in the output as a result of change in the input. So, this I am calling as uh, v naught and as a result for a single pole system we have an overall response coming like this v naught e to the power of minus t upon r c and uh, if the pole is towards lower frequency or the time constant is larger then we know that this r c time constant will be worse and the charging will be or the rising of the signal can be much slower. Likewise, on the other side when you are going towards the negative phase phi 2 there I expect that the signal will be going down there also if the r c time constant is large or the pole is towards low frequency rather than the signal going down quickly it will take good amount of time to go down. And it may so happen if you can see it may so happen that the signal does not even reach the required value it does not even reach the final value. If the clock frequency is much larger as compared to the pole frequency the signal may not be able to reach the final destined value. As a result the final value that you get is going to be dependent or it is going to be having non-linear dependency on the input signal. If your input signal change is smaller or the delta v that you are seeing over here is smaller then it will be able to settle uh, more you know conveniently, but if the delta v input is larger it will take larger time to settle 
or it will not be able to reach the you know maximum value that is supposed to be there. So, it can lead to non linearity and uh, the ideal multiplication function that we are trying to implement that will not be achieved. So, we would like to have this settling as fast as possible. So, this rise time should be much smaller as compared to the overall uh, half period of the clock. So, I would like my signal to settle much faster. So, within 1 if, if this is t by 2, I would like the settling time to be close to 1 by tenth of this. So, I would like this uh, settling time t settle within which the signal is settling to the final value. If I call this t settle, the time taken by the signal to reach the final value trusting on the sampling uh, uh, instance, I would like this to be at least say uh, to be conservative 1 upon 10 t by 2. And that means the pole frequency will be 10 to 20 times uh, higher as compared to the uh, frequency of the chopper. So, if the pole frequency is higher or the bandwidth of the amplifier closed loop amplifier is much higher, then the uh, chopped signal at the input and the output finally, it will be able to settle properly to the final value. So, that is the reason why we need to choose the pole frequency much higher than the chopping frequency. So, if I assume that the chopping frequency has been taken as 1 kilohertz, that would imply that the uh, amplifier bandwidth would be even larger, maybe at least around 5 to 10 kilohertz to be more conservative, maybe 20 kilohertz. So, let us stick with a um, reasonable number 10 kilohertz. So, if F c is 1 kilohertz, let us go for the closed loop amplifier bandwidth as 10 kilohertz. So, we have discussed this briefly while discussing the chopping operation also that why do we need uh, to have a higher amplifier bandwidth when we go for the chopping operation. So, chopping is helping us in shifting the signal towards higher frequency 1 kilohertz, but the amplifier bandwidth needs to be even higher than that because the chopping clock is uh, acting like a square pulse and within that the signal must settle fast enough and for a good performance I would like my signal uh, to settle within one tenth of that uh, half period. So, uh, in this case let us choose the amplifier bandwidth to be 10 times f c let us call it uh, closed loop bandwidth. So, f um, or bandwidth close that can be chosen as say 10 kilohertz. So, this is uh, the slightly modified requirement that we have as compared to uh, that we started with what we started with in the very beginning. In the very beginning, we did not uh, consider the concept of 1 upon f y or chopping and uh, we started with a naive assumption that yes, your signal frequency is from 0.5 hertz to 100 hertz. So, possibly I can design my amplifier to meet this uh, particular bandwidth. In certain cases, in certain cases where the signal strength is sufficiently large, we may be able to uh, do away with chopping. For example, if you are talking about some biomedical signals which are having much stronger amplitude rather than few tens of micro volt, they will be having few millivolts at least. So, in that case, uh, the signal magnitude is sufficiently large and even if the frequency content is down to you know close to even uh, a fraction of hertz, you can do away with chopping. But in cases where the signal magnitude is so low, 10 micro volt or few micro volts, there um, the 1 upon f noise becomes very serious and as a result I have to we have to go for the chopping operation. So, in case of the particular application that we targeted neural potentials uh, there of course, uh, the signal content uh, the frequency content is this, but the amplitude is also pretty low and that would uh, necessitate the use of chopping. If you are talking about some other signals like an um, ECG signal for example, there the amplitude um, coming from the uh, electrode can be pretty significant or pretty large as compared to this you can be few millivolts. So, their chopping may not be necessary, but for neuro potential acquisition because of much smaller input amplitude chopping becomes very important uh, almost necessary. So, uh, let us now uh, conclude that okay, the closed loop bandwidth is supposed to be 10 kilohertz and uh, now we need to look go for the open loop bandwidth and the gain bandwidth product. So, the gain that was expected was the closed loop gain overall say we are going for around 10 to the power of uh, 4 that is what we estimated. So, uh, if for example, if you have in the maximum signal amplitude of 100 micro volt and then the closed loop gain is in the power of 4. So, the maximum peak to peak swing that you can have at the final stage is going to be around 1 volt 
Um, so, for a 2 volt VDD, a 1 volt peak to peak swing can still be tolerable. If you uh, design the amplifiers properly so that the output stage uh, uh, swing is maximized, then you can go for a uh, uh, larger output swing. And therefore, the overall uh, gain that we are targeting from the amplifier stages and maybe even the filter stages, overall uh, it will be uh, 10 to the power of 4. And then we can uh, divide this gain into two stages. So, we also discuss the rational for that rather than going for single stage, we can divide it into two stages and one single amplifier was supposed to have a gain of uh, closed loop gain of around 50 to 100. So, let us you know take it to be 100 at the max, mm, more reasonable numbers are 30, 40, 50. So, let us take let us be more aggressive, let us take uh, closed loop um, gain of around 100 for each stages and therefore, we have the A f uh, which is going to be approximately 1 upon beta equal to 100 and also uh, we have the a naught and remember how did a naught come into picture a naught is determined by the precision required. So, uh, the 1 plus a naught beta term uh, if you want to ignore that one with respect to a naught beta the overall uh, a naught beta should be at least 100 times higher than 1 if you are going for 1 precision precision and therefore, uh, here if I am taking uh, beta equal to 1 upon 100 I would like to have a naught 10 to the power of 4. So, this would give me a naught around 10 to the power of 4, so that such that a naught times beta is greater than uh, at least greater than 100, greater than equal to 100. So, that will ensure that you have 1 percent precision in the uh, uh, term 1 plus a naught beta. When you are ignoring this 1 with respect to a naught beta, you are incurring an error and that error should be less than 1 percent. For that, I would like this a naught beta to be greater than 100, greater than or equal to 100. So, that will give me the a naught 10 to the power of 4. So, from here we have the open loop gain of the amplifier and we also have the uh, closed loop bandwidth. So, from here we can also obtain the uh, open loop uh, the gain bandwidth product and the open loop bandwidth of the amplifier. So, the closed loop bandwidth is targeted to be 10 kilohertz and we know that uh, closed loop bandwidth 10 kilohertz is going to be equal to open loop bandwidth sorry B w this is going to be open loop bandwidth B w open times 1 plus a beta 1 is small. So, times a beta approximately. So, uh, here we have also seen that the a beta is uh, we are choosing it to be around 100 and as a result the open loop bandwidth can be taken as 10 kilohertz divided by 100 and therefore, uh, the bandwidth open is around 100 hertz that is what uh, we looked at. So, open loop bandwidth of the amplifier that we are trying to design is around 100 hertz considering the gain bandwidth product requirement and also we have the a naught as 10 to the power of 4 and that gives me the gain bandwidth product g b is equal to 10 to the power of 6. So, this is our modified set of uh, gain and frequency considerations that we arrived at considering the uh, chopping operation considering the 1 by f noise mitigation. So, the gain bandwidth product is uh, an important feature of the overall uh, open loop amplifier with which we can begin the design. And now, while looking at the design, we have to recall how does the gain, gain bandwidth product depend upon the uh, circuit parameters of say the two stage op amp and from there we can proceed step by step and look at the other parameters uh, like the uh, overall bandwidth and the signal swings and include them step by step. Also, uh, looking at the interface of the circuit with the next stage and the previous stage, we have to uh, uh, estimate the value of the load capacitance, which is going to play a role in determining the uh, capacitance value, composition capacitance values. So, let us start with the required gain value product of uh, 10 to the power of 6. And of course, if you look at the uh, if, if you look at omega, there will be 2 pi times 10 to the power of 6. In terms of hertz, this is just 10 to the power of 6 hertz. So, let us uh, keep it 10 to the power of 6 hertz. And uh, now, if I go back to my two stage op amp, we have derived the expression for gain bandwidth product, overall bandwidth, um, the overall small signal gain. So, we are going to just use those in order to uh, uh, arrive at the values of transconductance and the composition capacitors, etcetera. Uh, one of the uh, inputs required to do the calculation will be the load capacitance. What is the load capacitance faced by that uh, amplifier? And towards that end, again we have discussed that the load capacitance ultimately for the overall differential operation depends upon the next stage input capacitance. So, uh, you may be having the next stage input capacitance 
acting as the load capacitance of this stage. So, you have uh, in the next stage once again you know remember that this point is going to be AC ground for the another uh, next stage amplifier and as a result the overall input capacitance sorry uh, the overall load capacitance experienced by the stage 1 amplifier which is built of my two stage op amp is going to be given by the CC or you ca sorry the C1. So, if I call this C1 and call this C2, C1, C2, we know that the overall gain for both these stages will be given by the ratio C1 upon C2. Uh, and if I look at this stage, the, the two input points can be treated as AC grounds uh, or rather they are going to be very close together, they are not going to have any signal swing, significant signal swing. As a result, uh, these two C1 values appear as effective load capacitance for my output point and therefore, uh, whatever is the value of C 1 we can take it as a load capacitance and again value of C 1 depends upon the value of C 2 and the gain required and there uh, if you remember the discussion that uh, overall gain uh, 100 that would mean a ratio of 100 between these two and C 2 minimum value will be determined by the parasitic capacitance of the um, amplifier. So, if uh, the C 2 is sufficiently large as compared to the parasitic capacitance of the transistors then the gain will be uh, relatively well defined by the ratio of C 1 upon C 2. If you make C 2 too small and it becomes comparable to the parasitic capacitance of the amplifier, then it is the gain uh, precision or the gain uh, uh, is less precisely defined. So, I would like to keep C 2 at least few times few, maybe 10 times larger than the parasitic capacitance value and uh, we saw that maybe 100 femtofarad is uh, a good value for C 2. And uh, we have seen that the MOSFET dimension based on the MOSFET dimension that we have the overall uh, capacitance that you can get at the output node may be uh, of the order of few tens of femtofarad. So, I am uh, taking around 100 femtofarad for C 2 so that it is sufficiently larger than the parasitic capacitance is at the output node. Uh, and then you have the C 1 which uh, again needs to be 100 times the C 2 therefore, we can keep this of the order of 10 picofarad. So, it will be within few picofarad to 10 picofarad that is the expected range of C 1. And in the beginning we have also discussed that at least for the second stage we may need to keep the C 1 programmable or tunable because we may need to adjust the gain of the overall amplifier depending upon the input signal strength. So, sometimes if the input signal peak to peak is increasing because of the change in the interface property of the electrode and the electronics then the overall gain over here may need to be reduced whereas, if the signal strength is reducing say from uh, you know 100 micro volt it is going to 10 micro volt peak to peak. In that case the overall gain of this amplifier stage may need to be increased. So, uh, that depends upon the overall magnitude of the input signal and we have discussed this reason why we need to increase or decrease again. So, that we can fully utilize the dynamic range of the ADC. So, we very briefly we have discussed in the beginning that the ADC are the fixed input range I would like to map the final output signal amplified and process output signal to the entire input dynamic range of the ADC. So, we will discuss that once we uh, have a discussion on ADC we will look into the um, uh, dynamic range concept once again in detail. But uh, if the dynamic range of the ADC is say 1 volt I would like that the output signal over here is always mapped to that entire 1 volt range. So, that the final output peak to peak swing over here is close to 1 volt peak to peak. So, if the input signal changes I need to program uh, the C 1 C 2. So, that uh, depending upon the strength of the input signal over here I am um, setting up the gain. So, that it is mapped to the entire dynamic range of the ADC. So, that is that was the concept. So, one of these stages uh, generally the second stage amplification is kept programmable. <coughs> open loop bandwidth ultimately you have to uh, look at the total you know the open loop bandwidth depends upon the uh, critical pole the uh, P 1 which you are trying to compensate and load push towards lower frequency. So, that P 1 is not directly dependent upon the load capacitance as such. So, that is dependent upon only the capacitance the C C the compensation capacitance and the gain of the second stage that is going to determine the open loop bandwidth. So, that does not have interaction with the uh, yeah. So, as I said ratio is determined. So, in order to get a certain phase margin yes you need a certain ratio between the C C and the C L. So, that way it is related, but if I say that how is the bandwidth determined open loop bandwidth or the uh, 3 dB cutoff frequency of the open loop amplifier that is determined by C C and the gain of the second stage C C times uh, A 2 times the R O that gives you the R C time constant of the first stage. 
<coughs> so uh, we have so so that basically we can assume that the overall load capacitance cl faced by the first stage is say uh, 10 picofarad so this is uh, the cl given to us and now we can go back and find out the value of gm in terms of the uh, the two stage op amp circuit parameter that we have uh, we have uh, seen that the uh, gain value product depends upon the gm1 upon cc where cc is the composition capacitor and in order to achieve a 45 degree phase margin we said that the gain bandwidth product should be equal to the P2 or the second pole should be equal to the gain bandwidth product which is equal to GM1 upon CC and but for the second pole value the this is this is the expression for gain bandwidth product the which is P1 times the open loop bandwidth if you remember and this should be equated to the second pole. So, the pole 2 P2 should lie at the uh, 0 dB crossing point and uh, uh, I for that I need to equate it to the gain bandwidth product that is what we discussed. So, I would like to make this equal to P2. What is P2 value? P2, if you remember, output stage, this is going to be given by Cl, the overall load capacitance at the output stage, times the R equivalent at the output stage, that basically becomes G 1 upon Gm2. So, for the two stage op amp, the R equivalent at the output stage is just uh, 1 upon Gm2, and therefore, uh, I just need to make sure Gm1 upon Cc equal to Gm2 upon Cl, and that is going to determine my. Uh, relationship between these two parameters gm1 and gm2 cc and cl also i would like to have certain power constraints so since we are looking at a low power application i will start with certain power budget for the overall front end amplifier um, say i take the i bias total as 30 microampere um, for the total amplifier uh, or say keep it 40 microampere for the total amplifier and in that case uh, each of the two stages is having 20 microampere each and that means uh, each uh, branch is going to have 10 microampere. So, uh, it is not necessary to keep the same bias current in all the branches like if you have the first stage differential amplifier, second stage common source amplifier, I may choose different bias current for different stages and uh, uh, we know that the bias current generally in the first stage uh, needs to be higher or the bias current requirement is higher and the reason is that we have overall gain requirement as well as noise requirement determined by the gm of the input device and uh, uh, especially for the noise requirement we need to have a sufficient bias current available in the first stage so uh, we can uh, factor this bias current to divide this bias current in an uneven fashion also we can uh, preserve 30 microampere for the first stage and lower amount of bias current for the second stage or uh, we can go for equal division also that is a design decision and uh, uh, iteratively if I start with the 20 micro 20 micro division and it finally seems like it does not satisfy the noise criteria I may have to go back and you know steal some more bias current from the second stage and divide it uh, uh, shift it towards the first stage. So, let us say that you know you can start with 20 micro ampere uh, bias current for each stage and this will give me 10 micro ampere each for both uh, for all the branches the differential branch as well as the output branch. So, this is uh, a requirement which is given to me from the uh, top level specification I have estimate of power budget I want to stick within this or preferably I would even like to minimize this if uh, my requirements are well uh, achieved within this limit and I have a lot of margin left for optimization uh, we may further try to reduce this bias current to um, you know, save my power consumption. So, suppose this much bias current gives you a much better gain bandwidth product than required and much better bandwidth than required then definitely you have an option of you know, going down and reducing this bias current. Uh, further, so that uh, you can save power while satisfying the noise criteria. So, this is a starting value you have been given a requirement like this and then it is up to you how low you can go, but you should not cross this uh, you should not go above this that is the starting point. So, in the beginning I can try to make the use of the entire power budget that is available to me and then if it comfortably meets all the specs then uh, I have the target of minimizing power consumption also I can go back and try to see how low I can go in terms of this bias current. So, that I can minimize my power dissipation overall while maintaining while maintaining the other specifications especially the noise and the bandwidth. So, uh, I have say the bias current requirement coming uh, over here and then I have the overall uh, uh, the CC and CL ratio supposed to be determined considering the uh, overall area. 
So, if you remember the capacitance C 1 they are the largest capacitance over here as compared to C 2 this value is much larger and as a result they are going to be the most area consuming part of the front end amplifier. So, whenever you are going for uh, capacitive feedback or even resistive feedback the larger passive component takes the maximum amount of area. So, if you look at the you know physical design of the chip this C 1 the area will be much larger than all the other transistors area that are building this uh, amplifier and therefore, it would be prudent to minimize the values of the C 1 and also the corresponding compensation capacitor. So, uh, compensation capacitor also if it is close to the C 1 or the C L then again this also becomes a dominant factor and this also consumes a lot of area. So, it would be important to minimize both these areas both these values C L and C C. Now, C L we have already estimated that okay for a well defined gain and a gain of 10 to the power of 4 overall and hence a closed loop gain of around 10 to the power of 2 for one stage I need uh, C 2 upon C 1 ratio of 100 and as a result I am uh, going for a minimum possible value of C 2 100 femto per hour. So, that is to minimize C 1. So, C 1 is given to me I mean so this is the uh, minimum value of C 1 possibly I can have to uh, satisfy my range of uh, gain value that I want. And then once C 1 is determined I am looking at these uh, values now C C and C L. So, C L is basically nothing is, but the C 1 of the next stage. So, I can say C L is equal to C 1 which is equal to uh, 10 picofarad and then uh, if I make C C equal to C 1 then again I am doubling the area just doubling the area because uh, C C 10 picofarad means twice the area. Uh, now, if I want to be a little bit more uh, you know conservative I would like to push the C C value to a smaller uh, 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 number. So, that I can save area. So, I would like to make it say 5 pico per hour in that case only 50 percent additional area is being used. If I go a little bit more aggressive make it 2 pico per hour then of course, uh, the area consumed by this C C is significantly less as compared to the uh, C 1. So, uh, let us uh, start with a um, estimate that okay, let us keep C C equal to uh, 50 percent of C 1. So, that it is not adding more than 50 percent area as compared to C 1 definitely one of the important design constraint can be to minimize the C C as well and that again translates to the ratio of G M 1 G M 2 and sizing of the G M 1 G M 2 transistors and so on. So, if the area is very critical and you know every um, micrometer square is going to count in your design therefore, in those cases you would like to be more aggressive over here I would like to be more uh, you know point 0.1 times C 1 or point 0.2 times C 1 because I worry about every micrometer square I have to pack so many channels uh, I, have to talk, I have to pack maybe several tens of such channels to acquire multi channel uh, zero potential data. So, in that case I will be really conservative about area and there I would like to be more aggressive I will choose a smaller number over here. So, that the overall area can be as uh, minimum as possible for the time being let us just keep this C C as 0.5 times C 1 and as a result I have C C value determined and then I have the G M 1 G M 2 ratios uh, individually determined and also the individual values of G M 1 and G M 2 can be determined from this equation right. So, once I have determined the C 1 10 picofarad and I also have the ratio C 1 and C C I have basically uh, the value of G M 2 as well as G M 1 known. So, from here I can get the value of G M 1 which is the gain transit product times C C and likewise uh, G M 2 which is or let me stick to the round numbers G M 2 is equal to gain transit product times C L which is 0.5 times C C. And now, uh, once we have say the G M 1 G M 2 value determined and the bias current of the two stages determined uh, I also have the value of W by L estimated because G M 1 G M 2 determined by the I uh, I D 1 if I call M 1 as the input device I D 1 times W by L 1 and this is proportional to I D 2 times W by L 2. So, I have these two products determined and as a result uh, since I have already chosen I D 1 I D 2 to be around 20 micro each. I can uh, look at the W by L ratios of these two devices. The so, W by L of um, the uh, uh, G, uh, the W by L of the first stage, since it is just 
double that of the second stage I would need 4 times larger uh, W by L over there to meet the criteria. So, that is giving me the information of W by L for the uh, input device of the first stage and input device of the second stage. So, this is the W by L ratio we have not yet determined the W and the L, but at least the W by L ratio estimate is uh, here for the input devices of the first stage and the second stage. Now, so we can take two minutes break after that we will resume the discussion.